Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology, and I want to thank all of you for joining in on our webinar today to discuss the new features for AFT Fathom 12. Uh, we are very excited for its release, and there's a lot of cool new stuff that you can do with it. And I'm going to go through just a handful of some of the new features today that I think are really useful. And uh, that way you'll be able to get a better idea of how you might use them. Some of the new features here that we have in version 12. So as you can see in this particular model, I have several scenarios. One, two, three, too many to count. So uh, what I want to demonstrate first is a new batch run enhancement that we have, which is really helpful. Uh, so if I wanted to go through and run all of these scenarios, go grab a quick cup of coffee and then come back and analyze all my results, there's a more efficient way that we do those batch runs now. So the way that you do it is by going to the file menu and then start batch run. And I've already added in all of the scenarios that I want to run. So there's uh, 30 of them. Uh, this has all been there for a long time. None of that's new. The things that are new are found right down here where uh, you can close the window when the batch run is finished. And then also, this is really helpful, running the batch run in the background. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to click on that checkbox to run the batch run in the background, and we'll start the run. So here, this is running every scenario in the background with this window here. The reason why this is helpful is because I can then open up the uh, you know another window. Maybe it's a Word document or a PDF or something. I can do things and I'm not getting interrupted by the Fathom batch run window constantly popping up on my screen. As you can see, it's staying down here in the background. So that's a, a useful new feature that allows you to stay uh, efficient with what you're doing and you can get other things done while you're running a bunch of scenarios. And so uh, here, as we can see, it's uh, at 60% progress. And I needed to run the uh, model anyway because the next enhancement that we're going to talk about is uh, warning messages and the organization of them. And so uh, another thing that uh, you can... Uh, if you want to find a full list of the new features of Fathom 12, you can go to the products menu and then AFT Fathom. And then uh, when you come down here and view the features, this is where you can find the uh, AFT Fathom 12 new features. And that will give you a full list of all the new features as well as the key new features that came out in Fathom 11 and Fathom 10. So don't forget about those features because those are really helpful also. All right, so as you can see here, all of the uh, scenarios are finished running. And this is another improvement that we made is in the uh, uh, window here where we have, uh, I was trying to turn on my highlighter and it apparently doesn't work in this uh, pop-up window. Uh, only here. <laughs> it's not where I wanted to circle. Uh, let me try this. Uh, so what you see here is if each scenario ran successfully and if there are any errors behind it, that is important to know and that is uh, helpful. But the other thing that's new is that we will be telling you which scenarios had warning messages or design alert violations. So as you can see, my first scenario, no warnings, but it had 10 design alert violations. Second scenario didn't have any warnings or design alerts. Third scenario had one warning and one or zero design alerts, etc. So 
if you're getting ready to begin your analysis of 30 different scenarios, where might you start? Well, what you might do is scan down this list. <clears throat> you can copy this and paste it out to a, a text file or something, and you can give the model to somebody else, and they can start looking in, and you can tell your intern, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the uh, scenarios that have warnings and design alerts and start there and tell me what's going on. And so this would be a really good key for them to be able to find those issues. So now that we're done running the scenarios, I'm gonna close out of that window and go to the output window. Now this is already showing the multi-scenario output. What is multi-scenario output? It allows you to the, view the results for all of your uh, scenarios together at the same time. The way that you set that up is with the output control window. So if I go to the output control window here and then click on the multi-scenario tab, what you would do is choose the option to select scenarios and then click on the select scenarios button. So as you can see here, these are all the scenarios that I want to look at the results for. And here's the order that they're going to be displayed, and it will automatically color code the scenarios for you as well. So uh, these are all the uh, scenarios that I have, and uh, I'm not going to go into much detail about uh, the results because that's not what we're trying to pay attention to today. I want to talk about the warnings and design alerts tabs. That's the new stuff. So what we've done is we've uh, reorganized things to make it a little bit easier to digest. In the past, we would have all of the design alerts appearing on the warnings tab, and it would just be a lot to look at. First of all, what is a design alert? Well, a design alert is... If you have a minimum or maximum value of a certain parameter that the results have to be uh, within and can't exceed, you can set that up here and then Fathom will warn you if you have exceeded or violated any of these design alerts. So <clears throat> as you can see, my model has three of them. I've got a max velocity for pipes, and then I have minimum flow rates for some heat exchangers. So when I'm looking at the output window and I'm seeing the design alerts tab, this is telling me which design alerts are being violated. So this is really helpful because it breaks it down scenario by scenario. So the base scenario, we can see all of our velocity alerts were violated, but then nothing else for the next few scenarios. And then in the following scenario, we have a few velocity alert violations and a couple heat exchanger flow rate violations. And so this just gives you a breakdown of where you are violating your requirements throughout your model and all the different scenarios. All right, then we have our warnings tab. So the warnings tab gives you your warning messages, your critical warning messages, and your cautionary messages. Uh, so it color codes them. As you can see, uh, warnings are still colored in red. So in this particular scenario right here, it's telling me that my junction 203 BEP proximity is below the preferred operating range. <clears throat> so what I can do is go to that scenario. So this is this particular scenario right here. And the next thing that you can do is you can actually double click on the warning. And if you double click on the warning, it'll automatically take you to the workspace and it'll move your model to the location of that object and it'll select it for you on the workspace. This way you can then open up that junction 
and see if there's anything that needs to be addressed. Maybe there's an issue here with the input. Uh, maybe there's not. Maybe there's an issue with the system that's being modeled. Uh, nevertheless, it helps you be able to find where these warning messages are coming up a lot easier. And uh, just like uh, you've been able to do in previous versions, if you select a particular warning message and you hit the F1 button on your keyboard, that will bring up the help file where you can read about the various critical warnings, warnings, and caution messages. So if I click on, if I go back to my uh, Fathom model, we can see here this is a warning, not a critical warning, not a caution message. So if I go back and I click on warnings, item two, this will give me a list of all the different warnings that you might see. And so you would look for the warning in this list that you're getting. So it's uh, this particular guy right here. Junction X is percent VEP is above or below the preferred operating region. So if you click on that guy, it will take you to a topic where you can read about that message in a little bit more detail so you have a better, better of an idea of what is going on with those warning messages. As you can see here, I have another warning in another scenario which deals with the goal seeking control module. So if I go down to that larger filter scenario and this tells me what the warning is, my goal may not be valid. The goal that I specified for flow is 500 gallons per minute. The actual result that I'm getting is 506. Well, I'm okay with that. But if you wanted to, it can also sometimes give you recommendations saying that you might want to try tightening up your tolerances. And if you hit the F2 key like it does right here, it'll do it for you. And then when you rerun that scenario, it might get this uh, final goal result closer to your user uh, goal value that you specified. <clears throat> so this is where you can see how all of your warning messages are uh, organized per scenario, and uh, that's one of the, that's a huge improvement because in previous versions where you would have so many scenarios like this, and you'd be reviewing different scenarios and maybe doing that multi-scenario output, it wouldn't tell you if you had warning messages in other scenarios you would have to go in and load every single scenario individually to check and see if you had any warning messages in those scenarios. So with how we've been able to do this for all scenarios at the same time, that's a major improvement that I'm a really big fan of. And I think that you will be too. So, uh, Keep an eye out for that, and we also color code them to make it a little bit easier to read. All right, the next feature I want to talk about is multi scenario graphing. Uh, so, in this particular scenario here, I have a flow path that I want to plot, and I'm going to plot the flow path through this line right here, just like this, to this particular discharge reservoir. Now, I have three different families of scenarios. I have this family of scenarios. Uh, oops, let me circle that again. Uh, where is my... Okay, so I have, uh, I have this family of scenarios. I have this family of scenarios. And I have this third family of scenarios. So what's different? Well, this uh, first family of scenarios, this um, that uses uh, water. And then just to make things a little bit different, this scenario uh, family uses caustic soda. I just made it up. So if we go to that scenario and open up our system properties window, you'll see that this window looks a little bit different. I'll talk about that later. So here's my uh, caustic soda uh, fluid, 
And then in parent three, um, let's see. I'm trying to remember what's different about that. I'm using toluene. So those are three different fluids in the different scenario families. And what I want to do is I want to plot that flow path for the larger filter scenario of each of those family trees. So I'm going to plot this flow path for this scenario and this scenario and this scenario together all at the same time. So that is a really powerful new feature. So I'm going to select the pipes on the workspace first. Once you select your pipes on the workspace, when you go to the graph results window after that, I'm going to do a profile plot. And so if it didn't have any boxes checked, you would just click on the workspace button, and that will select the boxes for pipes that you have selected on the workspace. So it's easier to select it on the workspace first rather than checking the boxes individually. The next thing is under multi-scenario, click on that drop down and then choose select scenarios. Now, if you're doing this, your different scenarios obviously have to be you know relatively the same. Like they have to have the same pipe numbers in each scenario. So if you removed any of the uh, pipes in any of those scenarios, then it wouldn't necessarily get plotted uh, like you would expect. So make sure that it's consistent across your different scenarios and that you're comparing apples to apples. Okay, so I've set up my three scenarios. I'm just going to start off with comparing the pressure of each scenario and we'll generate the plot. And there we go. So uh, this gives you your plot of all the different scenarios and it gives you the scenario name right here in the legend now <laughs> uh each scenario is called larger filter pressure static what in the world does that mean well if you right click on the legend you can choose this box right here to show your full scenario path for each scenario and then you can also highlight the current scenario you that you have loaded so this is the current scenario that i'm actually operating in and then these are the other two scenarios that are getting plotted with it so uh this is a lot to keep track of and it just depends on how you, you set up your scenario tree and that way you can be able to plot your different uh, flow paths for different scenarios all together. That's definitely a uh, long-awaited uh, capability that uh, we've been waiting for for a long time. Okay, so now let's go ahead and jump back into the workspace here. I want to talk about special conditions really quick. So uh, special conditions allow you to turn things on and turn things off so if i open up a pipe property window and go to the optional tab you can see that there are two special conditions none and closed none would mean that the pipe has flow in it and fathom will calculate that if i wanted to close off a flow path i would click this option to say closed and then click ok and when it closes off the flow path, you'll see a dotted line. And the red X means that you have a special condition for that particular object. Now, this button right here allows you to toggle your special conditions on and off for a selected item on the workspace. If I select two of these pipes right or two of these pipes right here i can close both of them so as you can see both of them have the special condition applied i can select them again and then i can turn it off so nothing's new on that <laughs> but it's to set up what i'm going to show in a minute for a pump there are multiple special conditions so in here 
you can find that there's actually three special conditions for a pump. There's none, that's where it's just operating regularly. The second one is pump off with no flow. And the third is pump off with flow through. The question is, when do you use one of these or the other? Well, it depends on what type of pump that you're modeling. If you are modeling a centrifugal pump, then the more appropriate option that you would use would be pump off with flow through. That's because if you had a pump with a impeller on it, hope my drawing is okay. So there's my pump and here's my uh, flow coming in and here's my flow going out. So if I was to unplug, here's the, here's the wall and here's the wall socket. And if uh, this is the extension cord, somebody unplugged that from the wall, that's not going to allow the pump to run. So it's not going to be uh, providing any increase in pressure. However, I've got this supply reservoir right here where based upon the hydraulics of the system, I would potentially have a open flow path through the pump where if I don't have any valves that are closed off and this valve is open, then you might see flow through the pump. And that's what would actually happen in real life. So if you have a centrifugal pump and you want to turn it off, you're going to need to use the pump off with flow through option. Now, how do you actually close off the flow? That's where you would need to close the valve. C for closed. So here, if I choose pump off with flow through, you'll see the X. That means that I, uh, I've applied a special condition for that junction, but there's still flow through it. Well, how would I cut off that flow? I'd have to put a valve in the line. So if I put this valve in the line here, just like this, and then I go into my valve and I close that guy, now that's what closes off the flow. So when you're using a centrifugal pump, choose the pump off with flow through option. And then for the valve downstream, or maybe you might have one upstream, when you close that valve, that's what will cut off the flow for you. <clears throat> one second all right now if you're doing a positive displacement pump that's a little bit different a positive displacement pump you would choose pump off with no flow and the reason for that is because if you're modeling a positive displacement pump and you unplug it from the wall it's going to act like a closed valve and you're not going to see any flow through it so that would be the appropriate one that you would use for a PD pump. Now, it doesn't mean that you uh, can't set this up with a centrifugal pump and still use pump off with no flow because you can, but it's important to pay attention to what you're doing and model your system as you would in reality. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're working with this. Okay, so why in the world did I go into all of that information? Well, it's because for some junctions, you might have three different special conditions. For pipes, you only have uh, two special conditions. For other junctions, uh, like a valve right here, you only have two special conditions. So in previous versions, this circle with the slash through it would toggle the special condition on and off. But the issue is that for junctions like a pump that had multiple special conditions, which special condition would it toggle if you are using this button? Well, now in Fathom 12, if you click on that button, it tells you the 
different options here. So if you have one of those special junctions that can do more than uh, two special conditions, you can choose which one you want from the button. And so doing this from the workspace makes it a lot easier rather than having to go into the property window of each individual junction. That way you can do it right from the workspace. So I can select those and turn them on. And you can, same thing goes for control valves. Control valves, you have the same sort of concept. But for control valves, it's either none or closed, or you can open it all the way up with no control. So if I select that control valve, there it is. None, closed, and then fully open, no control. So uh, that's a, a new enhancement that we have there. All right, let me go back to one of these scenarios. All right, so let's see here. Let's say that uh, for this particular valve right here, or let's see. Uh, let's do this. Okay, so sometimes you have a situation where uh, you have a really short, tiny pipe because for whatever reason, Maybe I need to expand to a larger diameter to get into this uh, filter right here. So if this is a area change where, uh, all right, well, I'll do conical. And so uh, if I'm going to maybe uh, 10 inches in diameter, let's say that this is 10 inches, there can be areas all throughout your model where you have these very short uh, connectors because it's not possible to connect a area change junction directly to a filter where if this is your uh, filter here, your area change might be connected just like that. And, and then, you know, here's your filter with all the, the packing. And the problem is there's uh, no piping in between these two components and so this is something that sometimes people struggle with because in the software you have to put a junction on each end of a pipe and it's not possible to connect a junction to a junction so uh you know what would you do in this scenario where you're uh in reality you've got one component connected directly to another with no piping in between how do you model that? Well, traditionally what you would do is you would just model a short pipe, maybe call it, you know, 0.01 and maybe, you know, if you can still set the roughness to uh, something different. You can make it, you know, hydraulically smooth, etc. Well, a new feature is this option right here to model it as a zero length connector. So when you model it as a zero length connector, the only thing that it does is it keeps the diameter, but it's gonna have no pressure drop. And so this tells you exactly what it's doing. And all that does is it allows you to basically connect two junctions to each other with a fictitious pipe that has zero length. And so that's what the C means, that this is a connector. It's not a real, physical pipe that you're going to have in your system so uh, that's something that's nice where if you still really want to model uh, all of your uh, components explicitly as junctions rather than lumping them in as additional fittings for your pipes this allows you to do that a lot more easily so that's what the uh, junction uh, zero length pipe connectors will do all right, let's talk about the extended time simulation module really quick, XTS. 
<clears throat> if I was to click on this button to activate the add-on modules and turn on XTS, we can model transients to where you can open up and close your valves at different times, uh, different speeds, etc., cetera, uh, or rates of closure or rates of how fast they can open. So here's a cool new thing is that if you go to the optional tab, uh, this is not new. You've always been able to specify the open percent versus CV table for your valves. So if I just throw something in here really quick, uh, nice and simple, and go back and use uh, CV model, if I want to close this valve over time, uh, traditionally, you would only be able to do it as the actual CV change versus time or relative to a steady state value. Now, you can do the actual open percent versus time. So maybe you don't know how fast the CV changes over time, but you know how the open percentage of the valve changes with time. That's how you can do your open percentage directly. So at time zero, it's at 100% open. And then maybe in uh, you know 30 seconds, it goes down to 50. In another uh, 30 seconds, it goes down to 20. And then in 80 seconds, maybe it's all the way closed. So specifying that open percentage is really helpful. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and open up a blank model to show a few other new features here. So let's talk about the pump junction. So if I open up the pump junction here, I want to talk about submerged pumps first. So if I choose the submerged pump option, it allows you to model a <coughs> submerged pump where fluid will come into the impeller. And as you can see, you do not need a upstream pipe. So that's nice. Well, before there were only two ways that you could model this. You would specify either the, oh, where did it go? There we go. You would specify either the hydraulic grade line or the pressure at the inlet. So, you would have to do a external calculation to determine what this pressure was. You've got your surface pressure, and then you have your rho GH term, and you'd have to calculate that on your own and then enter that in directly into the field. The new option is where you can choose surface conditions. So this makes it a little bit easier. You can specify what your surface pressure is. So if this is atmospheric, I can just do zero PSIG and then put in my liquid depth. Maybe this is, uh, you know, 15 feet below the liquid surface. Uh, keep in mind this liquid depth, it's measured from the uh, liquid surface level here. So this means that I have 15 feet of head, but the inlet is still at zero feet. So this would be where if uh, if my inlet was basically right here and I was calling this level uh, zero, my liquid surface elevation would actually be 10 feet because there's my uh, depth right there. And so that's how all those things get taken into account. So that'll make it a little bit easier for you. Hydraulic grade line was a little bit more tricky uh, in the past because the value that you're supposed to specify here, that's the actual true elevation of the liquid surface uh, level that your pump is submerged in. And so uh, that's the reference that you would need to use for that. I wrote a blog article on it that you can find. And so... If you go to our website, AFT.com, this is worth pointing out because sometimes uh, there's confusion on what is meant by HGL. And so if you do a keyword search for HGL, then you'll be able to find this blog article that I wrote a while ago 
that explains it with uh, uh, beautiful uh, pictures that I try to draw. And this applies not only to pumps, but also to resistance curves as well. So if you just do a keyword search for HGL on our tips and tricks page, that's where you can learn more about that. And hopefully that'll clear that up. All right. Another new feature with pumps is this option to where you can model a pump as a turbine. So the interesting thing about that is if you install a pump backwards, where let's say that you have a, a reservoir at the top of a hill and you have flow down the hill and you have a pump down here, what you can do <coughs> is you can install the pump backwards so that you have reverse flow to the pump. So if I put a D for discharge and a uh, S for, well, that looks like a five, well, that's an S for suction, then this will cause your impeller to spin in the opposite direction. And when that's hooked up to a motor, it can generate electricity. So that's really cool. And here in Colorado Springs, uh, we actually have that situation where we have a reservoir um, way up high in the mountains and close to Colorado Springs, uh, we're trying to get that water to the wastewater treatment plant in order to treat the water and deliver drinking water to the city. But rather than just having the water flow down a pipeline, you know, we're gaining all this energy from that downhill flow. It'd be really nice if we did something with it. You could buy a actual turbine and generate electricity that way. But if you already had a spare pump that you're not using, or maybe a pump is just a little bit cheaper, then you can install it backwards and that can generate a little bit of electricity for you. So when you choose this option to run the pump as a turbine, you would enter your pump turbine curve. Now, these are, I'm as far as I'm aware, these are not values that you would get from your standard pump curve. You would have to get this from the manufacturer itself or have a sophisticated way of being able to estimate it. So uh, when you enter this data, that's not just coming from your regular pump curve. You're going to have to do some extra work to get that information. So <laughs> I, I would suppose that for anyone that is trying to use this feature, they would uh, know that that's what needs to be done in that regard. So that's the uh, pumpus turbine uh, junction there. All right. A uh, couple more things. I want to do a uh, quick throwback to a new feature that came out in Fathom 11 because it's worth uh, talking about it really quick. So whenever you hover over your pipes and junctions in the toolbox, you'll see these tool tips appear. And for the longest time, if you double clicked on the pipe drawing tool, you can draw as many pipes as you want. However, if I only selected the pipe once, I can only draw one pipe. Then I had to select it again and again and again and again and again. And it's really painful. So that's where double clicking it allows you to draw as many as you want, just like so. <clears throat> well, in Fathom 11, we turned on the feature to do the same thing for the junctions. So if you have five pumps in parallel, you can double click on the pump junction. That's what that stay active means. So if you double click on it, it'll stay active for the pump. So wherever you click your mouse, that's where you'll put a pump. And then I can zoom out and maybe there's five more that I need to put over here. And then maybe there's a couple of booster pumps over here that you need to put in. So I really like that feature and it was new in Fathom 11, but it is so incredibly helpful for being able to double click your junctions to lay out as uh, many as you want. So that way uh, you don't have to just constantly click and drag and click and drag and click and drag over and over again. 
Okay, now just a couple more things I want to demonstrate for the new features today. And one of them is this brand new analysis setup window. So in the past, where you would start building your model, if, if you didn't know anything about the software, you would want to focus in on the status slide in the bottom right corner of the interface. In previous versions, what this would do is it would bring up a checklist of items that needed to be completed so you can run your model. Well, essentially what we did was we combined all of those separate windows into a single window, called it the analysis setup. And so here, if I click on the analysis setup window, uh, let me restart Fathom here because that had some modules turned on. So I want to show what it looks like if you have uh, never opened it up before or if you didn't have any modules already turned on. Another th new thing is that we give a little status bar to show the uh, progress that Fathom is making towards opening up. So that's kind of nice to know. That way uh, you can see that <laughs> Fathom is actually doing something. All right. So here's my analysis setup, and uh, it's going to default to looking at the uh, fluid tab. But let's go through these one by one. So modules. This is a new way that you can activate the add-on modules. So you can also click on this button right down here. And if you click on that button, it's going to take you right directly to this tab. And this is where you can turn on the add-on modules. And it also gives you a little brief description of what each module does. So there's a little bit more insight there. So if you're ever wondering, what in the world does this automated network sizing module do? Well, it evaluates the complex interaction of system variables to reveal combinations of cost savings. Now, <laughs> you definitely want to go to our website to get some more information, but that gives you a one sentence idea of what it does. So that's where you can turn on your add on modules. Uh, you can then collapse that. The next is your fluid properties. So if I click on the fluid properties, it's going to take me to the fluid tab and the exclamation point means, hey, you have to specify stuff there. Just like before, follow the blue highlighting. That's your required input, and that gives you some exclamation points to flag your attention to data that needs to be specified there as well. So everything else is the same. Uh, here's another new thing is that with the AFT standard fluids, when you add a fluid to the model, all you need to do is just type in a temperature, and then it now automatically calculates your physical properties. If you remember in the previous versions, there was a button that you'd have to click that would say calculate properties. One less button that you have to click now. Uh, same thing goes for RefProp or ChemPack or the ASME Steam tables. Just put in your pressure put in your temperature, and bam, it calculates it right on the spot. So that's nice. All right, let's go back to user specified. There we go. Now, the viscosity model tab is where you can model different non-Newtonian fluids. And the new thing here is the herschel bulkley model. The herschel bulkley model <clears throat> is often used in sludge applications, food and beverage, and I'm certain that there's a lot more, but those are the main ones that I know about that are using it. And one of the things that I really like is that we are now showing you what the different uh, relationships for these viscosity models are doing. So if I was to choose power law, you can see here that the shear rate and shear stress relationship is non-linear, but it goes to zero. There's no additional stress that needs to be added to get things to start moving. So that's my power law. Bingham plastic 
has a linear uh, relationship, but you have to add a yield stress to get that fluid to start moving. And so now the Herschel Bulkley, this is a bit more complicated because here you have the nonlinear nature similar to a power law, but you also have a bit of a yield stress component. Just like the other non-Newtonian fluid modeling options, if you click on calculate from real logical data and then calculate your constants, this is where you can enter your shear rate versus shear stress data, and then we will calculate the constants for you. So uh, that's where you'd be able to model your different non-Newtonian fluids. And then uh, you can see how you've got your uh, list of undefined objects here. This tells you what pipes are missing information and which junctions. If there were pipes or junctions in this list and you clicked on one of them, it would tell you which input properties are missing. So that's helpful right there. <coughs> then uh, you can see your various uh, solution control tolerance parameters. So here's your tolerance. Uh, you can apply uh, relaxation and whatnot, et cetera. Uh, cost settings if you want to do cost calculations. And then uh, finally, we have uh, miscellaneous, where this is where you can do your NFPA reports using Hayes and Williams. There are different junction loss options. And so if you're dealing with non-Newtonian fluids or laminar Reynolds numbers, you might want to include losses uh, with the 3K method or equivalent lengths. Those are available. And, and then there's a couple other things that you can work with here that aren't really used very often, uh, but that's where you can find them there. And then you can collapse all the groups. So that is the brand new analysis setup window. Hopefully it allows you to be a little bit more quick and efficient with getting things set up to be able to run your model. All right, one more thing I want to talk about here is libraries. In previous versions, we called them databases. Now we call them libraries. So because that's more of what it actually was. Uh, database from our previous versions was not really the, the greatest term because when people hear the word database, they think of something else like a, a SQL database, things like that. No, it, it wasn't that complicated. It's just a library where you can put in your custom information. So if you go to library and then your library manager, we have basically combined all of the different individual databases into one single window. So in previous versions, there is a pipe material database. There is a separate component database for junctions. Then there is a separate fluid database, so on and so forth. So what we did was we put all of these into one single window. So your junctions, this is your custom component database for junctions. The fittings and losses, these are the fitting and loss uh, values that you would lump into the pipes themselves. And so all of that can be very well customized to however you want to set things up. Here's your uh, pipe materials database and then your fluids database if you want to create custom fluids all in one window and so hopefully that makes things a little bit easier and a little bit more streamlined for you to be able to use now another way that you can see what the new features were as well as you know six months later when you're forgetting about the webinar uh, you can go to the help menu and then open up the help file and this is always one of the best places to see the new features because if you go to the help file and then open up the overview, look at this. Here's what's new in version 12. And then this gives you a little bit more details behind the analysis setup window <coughs> and the libraries for Fathom 12. So this gives you a good list with some screenshots and then 
links to the other topics that talk about that new feature in more detail. So this is a critical area to keep your eye on. As you can see in my model when I was showing the uh, new organization for the warnings, I didn't have any caution messages. But this is a common one. The pipe length is shorter than the elevation change between these two junctions. Physically, that doesn't make sense, but we could still do mathematical calculations. This is just a helpful cautionary message that tells you that there's something that you've defined that doesn't make physical sense, and it tells you where you can address that issue at. So a caution message may not be as severe as a warning message. You can also go back to see, hey, what was new in Fathom 11? I can't remember. You can look here. You can see what came out in Fathom 10 and get links to those various help topics. Uh, Fathom 9, I really like it. And so uh, make sure you take a look through this. One other thing is that our help system is now available online. So we're using a brand new tool for the help system and it makes it really uh, user friendly, I think. Uh, you can print things out a lot more effectively as PDFs if you want. Uh, you can organize it in that fashion. And so uh, that's where you can see the help system online. And then uh, you can also use offline help. So if you don't have internet access, you can use offline help and then open it directly in, in that fashion. And that message tells you how to do it. All right, just before we finish up, I have a question that came in and it says, how quickly is this version in comparison with version 10 or version 9? Because now I work with version 10 on a VPN and it is quite slow. Well, the whole problem is because you're using a VPN for the software. We highly, highly, highly recommend that you install the software locally on your computer, not on a network server that bogs things down. And it's a much better option to install the software locally on your own computer. So if you go to our installation page under support and installation, here's where you can find our instructions. So here, uh, as you can see, we have our installation instructions and it points out that when you are going to install the software, the default option is to do a standalone slash client computer or what's also known as a local installation. That is our standard recommended installation. And as you can see here, it is not related to license type. So you can have a network license and still install the software physically on your computer. Using this option is much more advanced and you'd have to look at the appendix and that just bogs things down. So uh, the answer to your question is install the software locally on your computer. It's gonna work a lot better. And that goes for Fathom 9, Fathom 10, and Fathom 11. Always do things locally. And also when re with regards to model files, do not save your model files over a server. Instead, work on them, run them, save them locally on your own computer, like in your desktop somewhere. Then once you're done, save your model, close the software, and then move your model file up to the server so that others can use it. It's uh, There's a lot of data checking that goes on behind the scenes, and if you are saving and working on things over a server, and if there's even a very brief hiccup of connection that you have to your network, even a millisecond, that can cause file corruption. So long story short, install the software locally on your computer. That'll make your life much easier and it'll make your problems go away. Second is only work on, run, and save your model files locally on your computer. Do not open them from a network path. Copy the file down first, then open it directly on your local computer. All right. Well, that basically covers it for the uh, new features and a little extra for 
today. Thank you all very much for listening in. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call or send us an email, and we'll be glad to help. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your week.